and somebody said, are you looking forward to this? And I said, no. <laughs> I really had thought it would be half a dozen in a small room. And look at you. <laughs> Terrified. But for all that, it's a great pleasure to be here. And it all began because I was clearing out. Um, 50 years ago, I began a, PA, a PhD at Cambridge uh, on Hopkins. And I got a year done. I was under training to be a Methodist minister at the time. Consequently, um, I was stationed, as we politely put it, in Methodism, in Haiti, in the Caribbean, in the days before the internet. So all research into Hopkins had to be abandoned. But I kept the library I'd put together as part of my effort to achieve that distinction. And uh, Margaret um, has helped me to see that it's time I cleared my <laughs> shelves. <laughs> So I did want it to come where it perhaps might be appreciated, and uh, all the volumes are of the original stuff, properly edited and everything, and are a primary resource of the first order, and I'm just delighted. So here I am as a result of all of that, and um, conscious that in the next 30 minutes or so, I'll just give people an idea of how long it will last. It does help stamina. Um, if you know, um, I, I, I just hope to give um, a little insight into the spirit of Hopkins. And I've chosen, in order to limit my material and the ground I want to cover, to look at the two occasions, the first occasions when he spent his time under this roof here in Manresa House. Now, when I did the opening work on what would have been or might have been a PhD, I concentrated on the retreat notes that he made when he prepared to make his final vows as a full member of the Society of Jesus. And um, it all took place here, and I wrote a piece that in the end became an article um, in the church quarterly rather than a PhD that might have um, allowed me to claim a Cambridge doctorate. Um, and the curious thing is, it's all about that last retreat. The curious thing is, it's the last article before the magazine went bankrupt. <laughs> <laughs> I've had that effect on more than one institution <laughs> down the years. But let me, let me begin. You have to imagine it's uh, September the 7th, 1868, and Gerard Manley Hopkins, 24 years of age, is standing at the door of Manresa House. He's short, wan, intense, and frail. But what he lacks in physique, he more than compensates for in gifts of mind and spirit. He brings a rare range of experience and proven talent to this moment. He was born into a family of writers, musicians, and artists. His way with words and his artistic ability were clear from the beginning. His double first in Greek made him, in the words of the redoubtable Benjamin Jarrett, the star of Balliol. His years at university, 1863 to six, put him into close contact with a number of events and controversies, spiritual, intellectual, and aesthetic, which played on his mind and shaped his sensibilities. 1860 had seen the publication of Essays and Reviews, which brought modern critical methods to bear upon the interpretation of scripture. Jowett himself was a significant contributor. George Eliot's translation of David Strauss's Life of Jesus had been published in 1846. But Ernest Renan's Vie de Jésus in 1863. And this brought critical continental theology to the attention of British scholars, a development that was fiercely denounced by most church leaders. In art and general culture, the period saw a continuing interest in the work of the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood and to boot. Matthew Arnold held the chair of poetry at Oxford through these years. 
Hopkins had read publications from this movement. They played to his own natural gifts. They argued for an aesthetic ideal in which poetry and art might replace religion. One of its foremost disciples was Walter Pater, one of Hopkins' tutors, who took a, a close interest in him, which lasted, in fact, to the end of his life. 1864 was the year when John Henry Newman published Apologia Pro Vita Sua. 20 years earlier, Newman's conversion to the Roman Catholic Church had caused an enormous stir, and the appearance of his spiritual autobiography brought this back to life again. Ecclesiastically, ritualism and high church were the fashion of the day. Hopkins, for all his interest in liberal scholarship in theology, then current, and despite his fascination for the work of the Pre-Raphaelites, found himself drawn to the altogether more demanding and radical thinking of Newman. Newman became Hopkins' lodestar. Three months after his conversion in July 1866, Newman received him into the Catholic Church and then gave him a teaching role at the Birmingham Oratory. It was a time of deep searching on Hopkins's part. He reached the conclusion of this process by announcing that, to Newman that he did indeed have a vocation to the priesthood and a desire to enter, this was a surprise, the Society of Jesus. Newman greeted the news that his young ward had decided to enter the Jesuit novitiate with a simple word, don't call the Jesuit discipline hard, it will bring you to heaven. So as he stood at the door of Manresa House, he put all other matters out of his head. In a poem written during his Oxford years, he wrote these words, all other science all gone out of date, and minor sweetness scarce made mention of I have found the dominant of my range and state. Love, O oh my God, to call thee love and to love. So here he was at the very door of a new future. Having been close to key players in the intellectual, aesthetic, and spiritual events of his time, Benjamin Jowett, Walton Pater, Canon Lydon, Dr. Pusey, and above all, John Henry Newman, he was richly endowed with creative and scholarly gifts, intent on finding his own way forward. He'd resolved that this would be a way of renunciation. He'd burned the poems he'd written and called that act the massacre of the innocents. His new life would demand a great sacrifice. It would close off one world and open up another. The door opened. The young man was ushered in. The door shut behind him. On the other side of that door lay a life lived under discipline. Hopkins was one of six to arrive, last on the list. So he missed dinner and came way half through the rec recreation hour. Uh, they used to do this at Wesley, Wesley House where I studied during which only Latin could be spoken. Do you remember, Tim? After dinner, only Latin could be spoken. Not very Methodist. <laughs> Within days, he was given his own tiny cubicle in a large dormitory, like a stall in a well-kept stable. Within it was a narrow iron bedstead, a washstand with a pitcher and basin, and a charley, or chamber pot, shoved modestly away underneath. There was no heating in the dormitory. The main immediate task for the novices was learning the rules of the society. Soon a 30-day retreat began during which he kept almost total silence. He could neither write nor receive letters, though he did keep a journal. In a matter of days, he traveled from one world to another. He wore a kind of smock. Novices were taught to obey unquestioningly any instruction of their superiors. Part of the regimen was the suppression of aesthetic pleasure. 
and all the while, the closest attention was given to the spiritual exercises. All special friendships were strictly proscribed. Hopkins was assiduous at penance and mortification, but not always strong enough to bear them. His superiors kept careful watch over him, though he was unhappy to have the discipline lightened. When they insisted, he opted instead to undertake custody of the eyes. This meant that he kept his eyes cast down, looking at neither persons nor objects. This was likely to have been a great penance, a greater penance for him than it would be for the others, since it meant that he had to curb his natural tendency to look hard at everything he came across. When that happened, his walks around the grounds of Manresa House no longer gave him their usual delight. There were feast days, times for sport and games, though Hopkins disliked those intensely. Occasional opportunity to receive visitors and opportunities to visit churches in the vicinity. But all in all, these two years were tough. At the very heart of this lay the spiritual exercises of Saint Ignatius. The founder of the Society of Jesus had put these together during a stay in a cave at Manresa, near Barcelona, and they remain the core element of Je Jesuit spirituality to this day. As Ignatius put it himself, by this name of spiritual exercises is meant every way of examining one's conscience, of meditating, of contemplating, of praying vocally and mentally, and of performing other spiritual actions. Every way of preparing and disposing the soul to rid itself of all disordered tendencies, and after it is rid, to seek and find the divine will as to the management of one's life, and the salvation of the soul is called a spiritual exercise. Thus, four weeks, in inverted commas, four weeks were identified to deal with one's sins, to consider the life and ministry of Christ, to meditate on Christ's passion, and to know the kindling of God's love through contemplation of the resurrection. During these early years, beauty, was the theme that stood out at the heart of Hopkins's developing spirituality. This allowed him to maintain contact with much of what had filled his heart and mind before coming to Manresa House, a sensitivity to the beauty of the world, but now set in a theological frame of reference rather than an aesthetic one. His poem, The Leaden and Golden Echo, was written many years later but it shows a preoccupation with beauty which lasted the whole of his life. And I'm going to read it now, and you have it with you. But I would really like a glass of water. Reading Hopkins is definitely something that requires a glass of water. I'll drink it when they come back. Hold them at the door when they come back so that I can just get through this. The leaden echo. How to keep? Is there any, is there none such, nowhere known some, bow or brooch or braid or brace, lace, latch or catch, or key to keep back beauty? Keep it, beauty, 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 from vanishing away. Oh, there is no frowning of these wrinkles, ranked wrinkles deep down. No waving off of these most mournful messengers, still messengers, sad and stealing messengers of gray. No, there's none. There's none. Oh, no, there's none. Nor can you long be what you now are, called fair. Do what you may do. What Do what you may. And wisdom is early to despair. Be beginning, since no, nothing can be done to keep at bay age and age's evils, hoar hair, Rock and wrinkle, drooping, dying, death's worst, winding sheets, tombs and worms, and tumbling to decay. So be beginning, be beginning to despair. Oh, there's none, no, 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 there's none. Be beginning to despair, to despair, 
Despair, despair, despair, despair. Spare! There is one, yes, I have one. Hush there. Only not within seeing of the sun, nor within the singeing of the strong sun, tall sun's tinging, or treacherous the tainting of the earth's air. Somewhere elsewhere there is, well, ah, well, one. One. Yes, I can tell such a key. I do know such a place. Where whatever's prized and passes of us, everything that's fresh and fast flying of us, seems to us sweet of us and swiftly are done, done away with, done away with, undone, undone, done with, soon done with, and yet dearly and dangerously sweet of us. The wimpled water dimpled, not by morning matched face, the flower of beauty, fleece of beauty, too, too apt to mm, our fleet, never fleets more, fastened with the tenderest truth to its own best being and its loveliness of youth. It is an everlastingness of, oh, it is an all youth. Come then, your ways and airs and looks, locks, maiden gear, gallantry and gaiety and grace, Winning ways, airs, innocent, maiden manners, sweet looks, loose locks, long locks, love locks, gay gear, going gallant, girl grace, resign them, sign them, seal them, send them, motion them with breath and with sighs, soaring, soaring sighs, deliver them. Beauty in the ghost, deliver it. Early now, long before death, give beauty back, beauty, 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 back to God, beauty's self and beauty's giver. See, not a hair is, not an eyelash, not the least lash lost. Every hair is hair of the head numbered. Nay, what we had light-handed left in surly the mere mould will have waked and have waxed and have walked with the wind what while we slept. This side, that side, hurling a heavy-headed hundredfold, what while we, while we slumbered, oh then, weary then, why should we tread? Oh, why are we so haggard at the heart, so care-coiled, care-killed, so fagged, so fashed, so cogged, so cumbered, when the thing we freely forfeit is kept with fonder a care, fonder a care kept than we could have kept it, kept far with fonder a care, and we, we should have lost it, finer, fonder a care kept. Where kept? Do but tell us, where kept? Where? Yonder. What high is that? We follow. Now we follow. Yonder, yes, yonder. 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 I'm not sure that makes me feel any stronger, but... <laughs> right, so, in 1870, the novitiate over, Hopkins left Manresa House and headed off to, the, to Stonyhurst in Lancashire. He was now a scholastic and the three years which followed gave him greater opportunity to enjoy the sights and sounds of an entirely different part of the world. He filled his mind and his notebook with his observations. He began reading more widely. He worked hard at how best to deal with what he was seeing and hearing around him in the new landscapes and speech patterns of the Northwest. He worked at the task of how best to give expression to all that his senses were registering, so that his impressions spoke of God rather than merely the material world around him. These years also revealed what we might now call his bipolarity. There were moments of physical weakness and deep depression, which were certainly noticed by his superiors. They worried about him. So after three years in the north, he was sent back to Manresa House as professor of rhetoric. His duties were light, and he had ample opportunity to go out and about. He records his visits to galleries and museums and special events with obvious glee. He was able to receive visitors and also to spend time with his family. Father Alfred Thomas, my own former mentor, 
and longtime leading expert on the life and work of Gerard Manley Hopkins, described this assignment as professor of rhetoric at Manry's the House as a cushy birth. <laughs> 1873 to 1874 was a year for loading his brain and heart with material which would soon, like a river bursting its banks, pour forth all the work for which he's been so well known ever since. But let's look at the, some of the features that came to the fore during his second Manresa stay. This Oxford-educated middle-class man who'd lived a sheltered life seemed to see the inside of things and of people in the manner perhaps of Picasso in his Cubist period. He once claimed that when he looked at something, a leaf or a flower, patterns on a frosty surface or cloud formations in the sky, he got the impression that what he was looking at, gazing at, inspecting, seemed to be giving him the eye and looking right back at him. By the time of his return to Manresa House, Hopkins had already put the word inscape into his vocabulary. But now, during this year here, he resorts to it again and again in his description of things or people. It's a word which refers to the essential meaning, the inner coherence of every particular individual or item that distinguishes that person or thing from any other example or specimen. As one scholar put it, it's not a matter of something's superficial appearance. Rather, it's the expression of the inner core of individuality perceived in moments of insight by an onlooker who is in full harmony with the being or thing he is observing. He found philosophical justification for this way of thinking about beauty and so much else in the writings of a 14th century schoolman named Duns Scotus. Hopkins had discovered Scotus a few months before his return to Roehampton, but now here he immersed himself in this work and it gladdened his heart. Scotus had a word, a Latin word, haecetas, thisness. What's the thisness of anybody? The thisness of anything. What makes this different from that or anything else? That was the word he liked. He revealed how what he called mortal beauty may become supernatural. God's better beauty, grace. Hopkins, in many of his poems, concerned himself with directing his sensual appreciation of beauty to God by an act of love, by affirming beauty as an aspect of God's being in this way, it acquired an, e an eternal value, and the acts of love which achieve it are crowned with grace. It's this way of thinking that led me to chose the title for this talk. As kingfishers catch fire, dragonflies draw flame, Hopkins wrote. It's by doing just that that these creatures give, to, give expression to what is inherently, inextricably within them, an aspect of their deepest being, their inscape. Of course kingfishers catch fire. How else could they reveal just how gloriously they're made? People as well as creatures. What is, what I do is me, he exclaims. For that I came. And so it follows that the just man justices. You can't be just if from deep within you, you're not conditioned by your DNA and your moral outlook to act justly. The just man justices, acts in God's eye what in God's eye he is. In fact, this is how Christ is to be found in every living person, every living thing. He plays in 10,000 places, lovely in limbs and lovely in eyes, not his, to the Father through the feature of men's faces. We each of us have the possibility, a vocation even, to act in ways that are true to all that's inscaped in us. And doing just that to flourish and to give those around us an opportunity to catch and convey something of the presence of Christ. And so we move from substance 
the style. Hopkins drew his essential melodic inspiration from various regional and working class vernaculars. His fascination with regional speech shows frequently in the journals, and it was this loving egalitarian curiosity which led him to become a contributor to Joseph Wright's English Dialectic <coughs> Dictionary. Felix, Land Felix Randall, for example, a poem, a poem shaped out of his attentive listening to Lancashire speech. And the line, ah, well, God rest him, all road ever he offended, is pitched out from the talk of mill towns and Pennine villages. Anyone who enjoys the impulsive affection and vitality of regional speech is bound to notice that Hopkins' inner <coughs> ear is awash with an infinite and exquisite sense of unique vocal patterns. One critic, typical of others, complained about this, objecting to what he called the cumulative cacophony of Hopkins's verse. We've all met those who studied English literature. <laughs> but that view has long since been overcome by an increasing understanding of his way of writing. Hopkins listened intently to demotic speech in Liverpool, Glasgow, Lancashire, Milltowns, Wales, Dublin. By converting to Catholicism, he made himself marginal to the power structure in Britain and merged his imagination with the proletariat's experience, for amongst whom was the Catholic Church ministering chiefly, apart from recusant aristocratic uh, people hailing from the Middle Ages? Well, it was the working classes. Of course it was. By rejecting, I love this euphemism for Anglicanism, by rejecting his national old Egyptian reed. That's Anglicanism. He came to sympathize with the deprivations of powerless working people. He couldn't have put it more directly than as follows. My Liverpool and Glasgow experience laid upon my mind a conviction, a truly crushing conviction of the misery of town life to the poor, and more than to the poor, of the misery of poor in general, of the degradation even of our race, of the hollowness of this century's civilization. It made even life a burden to me to have daily thrust upon me the things that I saw. This conviction of immiserated poverty and the wild push of a popular revolutionary energy straining against the hegemony of Victorian English give Hopkins' poems their pouring, pelting, all in a rush quality of hectic movement. Whilst in Manresa House, he wrote on one occasion that he'd been experimenting with poetic styles that departed from accepted norms. Instead of carefully numbered syllables and the necessity to rhyme, he wanted his verse to approximate more nearly to ordinary everyday speech patterns. So his lines gathered in groups around key words. These were often alliterated and they moved forward rhythmically. Indeed, he called this way of writing sprung rhythm. Thank you, Sagan. Sagan and I, before we started, whilst he was still dealing with a canopy, um, asked me, you are going to say something about sprung rhythm, aren't you? <laughs> it had strong resemblances to Anglo-Saxon poetic style. Interestingly, while the southern reaches of post-conquest England were increasingly dominated by French, the court, and Latin, the church, the Northwest clung stubbornly for centuries to pre-conquest writing styles. So much of the work of Hopkins infused, escaped by all of this, it seems to flame out like shining from shook foil. His mind must have been awash with all these energies and ideas as he left Manresa House for St. Binos in Wales to begin his theological studies. It was there that acting on a hint from one of his superiors and seven years after his self-imposed ban on writing poetry, he composed The Wreck of the Deutschland, 
a long, agonizingly difficult poem inspired by the death of five Franciscan nuns traveling to exile in England to escape the Falk Laws, part of Bismarck's culture camp. As the editor of his letters put it, to read this brings to mind pent up floodwaters at last released by the bursting of a dam. And a critic adds, all the immediacy and intensity of seven years of religious life become articulate in this great ode born of silence. Here is the fullness of the praise, reverence, and service of God that had become his way of life. Here's the very epitome of the spiritual exercises in the completeness of the poet's dedication to the imitation of Christ, to the pursuit of the highest ideal, the Alter Christus. Hopkins' muse returned to him in Wales. Hooray, hooray. It was a Welshman just for a moment indulging his passion. <laughs> but his mind had been well stocked by all that had gone before. He went on to explore the heights and depths, the agony and the ecstasy of human experience. The rest, as the cliche goes, is history. In 1888, just months before he died, he wrote a poem which sums up very well the range of his emotions through these years. He looks up and sees the clouds scudding around almost playfully in the skies. He looks around him and sees both nature and humanity dragged down into cloddishness. What can save us from oblivion? And the other poem that you have is something of an answer to that question. <coughs> The nature, that nature is a Heraclitean fire and the comfort of the resurrection. Cloud puffball, torn tufts, tossed pillows, flawed forth, then chevy on an air-built thoroughfare. Heaven roisterers in gay gangs they throng, they glitter in marches. Down rough cast, down dazzling whitewash, wherever an elm arches, Shive lights and shadow tackle in long lashes, lace, lance, and pear. Delightfully, the bright wind boisterous, ropes, wrestles, beats earth bare of yester tempest's creases. In pool and rut peel parches, squandering ooze to squeezed dough, crust, dust, stanches, starches, squadroned masks and man marks. Treadmoil, treadmire toil there, foot fretted in it. Million fueled, nature's bonfire burns on, but, but quench her bonniest, dearest to her, her clearest selvage spark. Man, how fast his fired in his mark on mind is gone. Both are in an unfathomable, all is in an enormous dark, drowned. Oh, pity and indignation. Man shape that shone sheer off disseveral a star. Death blots black out. Nor mark is any of him at all so stark, but vastness blurs and time beats level. Enough. The resurrection, a heart's clarion. Away griefs gasping, joyless days, dejection. Across my foundering deck shone a beacon, an eternal beam. Flesh fade and mortal trash fall to the residuary worm. World's wildfire leave but ash. In a flash at a trumpet crash, I am all at once what Christ is, since he was what I am. And this jack, joke, poor potsherd, patch, matchwood, Immortal diamond is immortal diamond. He fell to the residuary worm in June 1889. The fact that we're here to celebrate his memory is surely testimony to his being an immortal diamond.
boundless of things. And I just wondered if you wouldn't mind saying something about that just now. I, I could have set you up with that. <laughs> Because you see, I did have a kind of a, an encore item. <laughs> because uh, I'm not a poet as Hopkins was. Um, I come from a very humble background. My life has been a very interesting, varied, uh, demanding, challenging life. I'd have done almost none of what I have done without Margaret at my side. Uh, but I did write two paragraphs, one about Hopkins and one about me. And I wasn't going to read them, but you've asked the question. <laughs> <laughs> you see, it is exactly 150 years ago that Hopkins left Manresa House after his year as professor of rhetoric. He was not the same man who'd arrived six years earlier. He'd had a classical education and excelled at his studies. In Oxford, he'd met a number of the key people of his age and via the route of renunciation felt able to deal with beauty by divorcing it from the mere aesthetic and making it the evidence of God's abiding strength. He'd spent three years in the North. I know I'm going over stuff, but it's important because the pattern becomes clear three years in the North and ministered to some of the poorest people in British society at that time. And he'd returned to Manresa House, which now became his finishing school. He left in 1874, ready to flourish, ready to allow all that had been inscaped in him to express itself, not for intellectual or aesthetic pleasure, but as a way of embodying, exhibiting the Christ who had effected the great miracle of bringing his undoubted gifts back into a full alignment with his spiritual understandings. He was 30 years of age. His apprenticeship had been completed. He was no longer a flower born to blush unseen, to waste his fragrance on a desert air. He never became the poet of his age, but he was undoubtedly a light for a future generation, a new century, a millennium waiting to be born. 50 years ago, 1974, almost 100 years to the day after Gerard Manley Hopkins left Manresa House, I returned to the United Kingdom from a four-year stint in Haiti. I was not the same man who'd arrived in Cambridge seven years earlier. Well, I'd had a Rolls-Royce education and excelled at my studies. In Cambridge, I'd been introduced to the key themes of the age. I spent four years in Haiti, the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. I was sent there because I spoke French, Haiti's official language. But no one in the dozens of scattered rural communities I served spoke it. For a while, I was totally powerless unable to understand or be understood. Haitian peasants, les miséreux de la terre, filled me with their culture, their language, and their warm friendship. And it was Christ in them who brought the poor boy I'd been back into a full alignment with the sophisticated young man I'd become. What had all the time been inscaped within me now began to flourish, and I entered my ministry much more aware of the people I was to serve. Like Hopkins, I was 30 years of age when I completed my apprenticeship. At last, I felt fitted to serve the present age, my calling to fulfill. That's the answer to your question. <laughs> Hopkins 
sense of his own sexuality also contributed to the enormous creativity of later years. That he struggled with that sexual dimension early on and then was able to give life to it through the illustration, which is so, so life giving and so life giving. Um, I just wonder if it's Yeah. Um. As soon as I saw you walk through the door, I knew this was going to be your question. <laughs> um, but thank you, Julius, very nice. Um, well, all I can say is that the proscription of special friendships was part of that initial discipline where um, everything has to be fixed on one thing only, so that the aesthetic is not just the pleasing of the senses, but is part of gaining a deepened ability of seeing God in the person you might otherwise simply have wanted a sensual relationship with, attracted by. Um, and so I've been very impressed, as I've read in readiness for this lecture, by the care, the pastoral care that the Jesuit superiors took of Hopkins. We get the impression that they're, they're harsh masters, or they broke no deviation, blah, 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 all of that. They've had a bad press, a bit like Rishi Sunak, no, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> um, but to come more to your point, um, there's no doubt about it at all that he had an affection um, for, well, one person in particular, um, and uh, possibly in others as well, and that he had to deal with the fact that he had the feelings he had. I'm always wary, however, of reading back into a situation the uh, developed sensitivities that you've accumulated over the years. Um, and, and so I, I don't think I can go quite as far as saying um, that there's simply a yes to, to, as an answer to your question. But I certainly can't fail to recognize that one of the things he was dealing with, not to suppress it and deal with it, reject it and deny it, but in order that it, like beauty, should find its proper place in the way he responded to the love of God. Bernie, I think you had a hand up. Oh, Leslie, um, I don't know if people uh, write this lecture up in a book form, but I hope they do it in an audio form as well. The man with the uh, camera behind you. <laughs> thank God, thank God. My, the hair stood up on the back of my hand as you were reading that first poem. So mm. my question to you is also a personal one, like Jackie's. What made you choose these two poems to highlight at the beginning and the end? Well, uh, well, uh, I hope that they did fit the narrative. Um, but for all of that, um, I read the Heraclitean Fire one when I was a student at Cambridge, and nobody in the audience understood a word of it. Um, <laughs> and um, and uh, on my bucket list, I wanted a public occasion yes. when yes. those two poems yes. might have a reading. <laughs> Um, I never imagined they'd be tied into something quite as um, grandiose as this, I have to say. And by the way, that chair, you know, I once went to a reception um, at, at Westminster <laughs> Cathedral. And I did, and in, in, in the big hall, um, I think Stephen might have been there even, um, uh, there's, a, there's a throne. Um, and I was, all I was was the president of the Methodist Conference, this is 30 years ago. And I saw this throne, and I thought, what, what must it be like to to sit in one of these. And, and, and so I sat in it, and lots of photographers came and took pictures of me sitting in this throne. And as this was happening, Cardinal Hume yes. <laughs> arrived and said, Leslie, he said, thank you for sitting there. I wondered what it would look like to have someone sitting there. I must try it myself one day. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Good. Well, well, <laughs> but Bernie, it is lovely to see you because we did go through all kinds of things together as, um, as the, um, the Institute of Higher Education, the Roehampton Institute, um, rapidly uh, evolved, um, came out of its, uh, its, its, its shell and, and declared to the world this new birth of Roehampton University. We were in the beginning, weren't we? Absolutely. Yeah, good to so see you. wonderful to be here. Good. Um, perhaps one final question. Very much, and uh, again, wonderful how you explained how you felt as you returned from Haiti. Um, 
made a connection with, um, with uh, the poet himself. A bit I'm confused about, though, is didn't you start a PhD before you went to Haiti? So what I'm wondering is, what was it that drew you to start the PhD on Hopkins no. before you had that experience that you then came back from Haiti? I've got it, I've got it, I've got the question. And, uh, you know, th thank you so much. I mean, uh, Julian, uh, Bernie, you, and uh, who answered the other? The, and thank you for all asking the questions I shortlisted down here. Um, <laughs> well, I had had an academic life before I went to Cambridge. I had got my degree in English, began a PhD on 14th century literature, when my professor ordered me um, to apply for a job. I said, but I'm a year into my PhD, and I'm enjoying it. I don't care, he said. Uh, St. David's College Lampeter is about to become the fifth college in the University of Wales. Cardiff has to supervise the arrival. I was in Cardiff. And if I've got to supervise the English department there, I need to have my boys down there doing the teaching. <laughs> so I applied. I was 21. Every bishop of the Church of Wales was at my interview. It was led by the Archbishop of Wales, Edwin Morris who ended the interview by saying, I had a little badge at the time, I, I see you're a Methodist, Mr. Griffith. I said, and I understand you're an Anglican, Your Grace. <laughs> 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 well, I got the job, and I was 22 when I started teaching med uh, uh, medieval English, everything from Beowulf to Chaucer, um, and loved it, absolutely loved it, um, and read widely, and it was a time of, but my PhD went by the board, because I was teaching the history of the English language, uh, Old and Middle English, uh, Anglo-Saxon, Icelandic literature, I don't know what. Um, so when I decided to go into the Methodist ministry, they sent me to Cambridge. And now I did my degree in theology. So here I was with a degree in English and a degree in theology. <coughs> and I had always had an interest in Hopkins, but my mentor at Cambridge was determined that there was only one subject for me to uh, read, uh, to study for my PhD, and it was Hopkins. But my mentor was none other than Gordon Rupp. And Gordon Rupp became my closest friend. Uh, he made all the contacts in the world of uh, the Jesuits for me. I went down to Farm Street. But it's the first time I've come in here where Hopkins was formed. So to do it here, is just wonderful, but that's how I chanced on Hopkins. But, but he loved Wales, he wrote poetry in Welsh, um, his brilliance was displayed in the language of the bards and the, uh, the, you know, the, the, the country of heaven, where milk and honey flow so liberally. <laughs> um, but also he had those cadences of Anglo-Saxon and Middle English in the way he wrote his poetry. All of it spoke to me, and that's how I did it. Now, that's it. Come on, stop it. 